Hi all. This is a second session on the novel The French Lieutenant Woman. In this session, we are attempting to find out whether The French Lieutenant Woman is a Victorian romantic novel or a postmodern novel. The novel, as we have already discussed in the previous session, is based on the 19th century romantic or gothic novel. John Fowles perfectly reproduces typical romantic characters, situations and even dialogues in this novel. But his perspective, however cleverly disguised, is that of the 20th century. Though there are certain Victorian romantic elements in the novel, the genre of the French Lieutenant Woman is rather confusing. It is not a complete Victorian novel. Although the first few chapters seem to nod at this genre and the rest of the novel keeps up some pretense of belonging to the tradition. Uh, James R. Baker has called the French Lieutenant Woman a pseudo-historical novel. So it seems important to outline a few features of Victorian literature that Fowles goes on to adopt or distort in this novel. The chief concern of the novel appears to be the effects of society on the individual's awareness of himself or herself and how that awareness dominates and distorts his or her entire life, including his relationships with other people. All the main characters in the novel are molded by what they believe to be true about themselves and others. Their lives are governed by what the Victorian age thought was true about the nature of men and women and their relationship to each other. In the beginning, we find the central character Sarah Woodruff or the French Lieutenant's woman presented as the dark, mysterious woman of the typical Victorian romantic novel. She becomes a symbol of what was forbidden. The readers get confused whether she is a villainous or heroine. It is this aura of strangeness about Sarah Woodruff that attracts Charles Smithson. A man falling in love with a strange and sometimes evil woman is an element of romantic novels. But soon we get to know more about Sarah Woodruff through her encounters with Charles Smithson. Her character is not that of a heroine of Victorian romantic novel, but that of the heroine of a postmodern novel. John Fowles has molded Sarah Woodruff with a totally different sort of character. Sarah has an existential view. She believes in the constant evolution of human self and personality. She prefers freedom to happiness. She appears profound and solemn in her act and belief. All these are characteristic features which make Sarah a postmodern heroine. Sarah Woodruff is presented as a mysterious figure. The author presents her as an educator but impoverished young woman. People believed that she had an affair with a shipwrecked French sailor and she is half mad with grief that she stares out to sea vainly hoping for the day he will return to her. But later we find that much of what people believe about her is untrue. Charles, at his mental level, puts Ernestina and Sarah beside and judges. In his act of judging between Ernestina and Sarah, Charles finds Ernestina hollow and superficial. On the contrary, he finds Sarah Woodruff very deep and profound. It is Sarah rather than Anastina who helps Charles to achieve the existential level of maturity. By putting Sarah as an embodiment of a postmodern cast of mind against, against Anastina as a representative of a Victorian cast of mind, John Fowles is questioning and challenging a set of fundamental Victorian principles and assumptions on the nature of fiction. So it is for questioning and challenging the fundamental Victorian principles and assumptions on the nature of fiction that John Fowles perfectly reproduced typical romantic characters, situations and even dialogues in this novel. 
This questioning and challenging is a characteristic feature of a postmodern novel. In the novel, John Fowles uses the popularity of the comedy of manners and combines it with the drama and sensationalism of the Gothic novel. By using several stylistic conventions, Fowles creates a masterful, many-layered mystery that is one of the finest pieces of modern literature. Now, let's find out how John Fowles has made the French Lieutenant's Woman a pseudo-historic novel by making the characters and setting belonging to the Victorian period and the approach of the author being postmodern. First of all, the pair of Charles and Ernestina Freeman, the aristocratic young lovers, they create a sort of romantic story, the type of which is the basis of many Victorian novels. The external forces, including the dark lady, interfere in the romantic situation around Charles and Ernestina Freeman and keep them apart. Charles Smithson is sensitive and intelligent, but unsure of himself. He considers himself to be a naturalist and a man of science. He is an admirer of Darwin and is pleased with himself that he is one of a minority in the 1860s to hold scientifically advanced ideas. Charles is actually quite traditional though he would like to think that he is not. He quotes Darwin and dabbles in paleontology. He represents the fashionable young man of his day who rebels against what he sees as the stiffness of his society. Charles is bored and dissatisfied with the normal course of his life. He finds nothing interesting in his affair with Ernestina. Everything about Ernestina appears normal to Charles. She is uh, just a conventional woman. Though she considers herself to be a modern young woman, her attitudes are similar to those of most proper young Victorian ladies. It is through her that Falls criticizes the superficial womanhood in Victorian romantic fiction. When Charles and Ernestina first meet Sarah, Ernestina gives him a brief account of the story of the fallen woman, who some say is mad. Charles, who thinks of himself as a scientist, is more tolerant and more curious than Ernestina. Charles is both disturbed and fascinated by the mystery and romance that he perceives in the woman. As we have already mentioned, it is the aura of strangeness about Sarah Woodruff that attracts Charles Smithson. In a romantic novel, a girl such as Ernestina might play one of several roles. If the novelist wants her to be the heroine, she would prove to be more unconventional and adventurous than she first appears. But if she is not destined to become the heroine herself, as in the case of this novel, she becomes the bright and pretty rich girl who is a foil for the actual heroine, the poor but intense young woman. Here the poor but intense young woman is Sarah Woodruff and Anastasia Freeman plays the role of the conventional aristocratic lady who is a foil for the actual heroine. Mrs. Paltney is another character stereotype you can find in Victorian novels. She could even be considered as a conglomerate of all the malicious old villainesses who have appeared in numerous Victorian novels. Mrs. Paltney's main motive in giving a job to Sarah Woodruff is to show how charitable she is. And it does not stem out from any real feelings of compassion for Sarah. Dr. Grogan, like Anne Tranter, represents a type of Victorian character who seems more understandable and less hampered by convention than most people. Mrs. Paltney and Mrs. Fairley are characters who are examples of the sort of hypocrisy that could and sometimes did flourish in Victorian society. 
Both characters represent types that appear often in Victorian novels. They were the sort of person that the author's social criticism was frequently directed towards. Both Mrs. Paltini and Mrs. Fairley are self-righteous and quite malicious. They possess few Christian virtues. Instead, they believe themselves superior to someone such as Sarah. Mrs. Fairley's jealousy and spying on Sarah and the gossiping of Mrs. Paltini on hearing Sarah's visits to the Ware Commons are all typical stuff for a romantic novel. The setting of the novel, Lyme Regis, also does justice to the Victorian novel. Lyme Regis has not changed much in a hundred years except for the advent of electricity, automobiles and television antennas. Ware Commons is another romantic stuff we find in the novel. It is a seaside patch of forest which is forbidden for young ladies because it was often used by couples as a meeting place. Such secret meeting places of young lovers normally appear in Victorian romantic novels. Now uh, let's find out how the novel actually belongs to the postmodern genre. If the fundamental principles and assumptions about the nature of fiction is questioned and challenged, postmodernist elements are supposed to exist. In the French Left Nance Woman, John Fowles has questioned the fundamental Victorian principles and assumptions, mainly through Sarah Woodruff. The dominant nature of Victorian text is a happy ending which becomes a structural requirement of the Victorian text. This structural nature of Victorian novel is questioned here. Charles Smithson, the hero of the novel, is shown condemned to live alone throughout his life. A Victorian novelist claims to have written his or her novel from the throne of literary omniscience. No character in any Victorian novel is unknown to the writer of that fiction. Victorian authorship claims to have known his or her character inside out. But this omniscient authorship is questioned by John Fowles. John Fowles himself has said that my own creation, Sarah, is mysterious to me. I don't know her completely. Victorian point of view is questioned here. In this novel, Fowles has questioned and challenged the Victorian narrative structure, the Victorian trend of happy ending and the traditional nature of the text. The moment traditional nature of a text is questioned, elements of postmodernism get introduced in the novel. Postmodernism in fiction subverts the master narrative. Master narrative is a narrative of emancipation. In the French Lieutenant's Woman, had Sarah accepted Charles, the novel might have been a master narrative, but Sarah rejected Charles. Consequently, it became an existential narrative of the protagonist's evolution of personality and progression of self. Any experimental world, anxious with elements of postmodernism, subverts all traditional components of the narrative. To achieve the purpose of subverting, the following devices are used. Parody, irony, distortions of narrative time, discontinuity, anachronism, blurring of genres, and ambivalence. All these above mentioned experimental devices are used by John Fowles in The French Lieutenant's Woman. The clearest example of parody can be seen in Fowles' use of epigraphs. Fowles has added an epigraph on the head of each chapter. Each epigraph differs from the other. Some epigraphs are from Darwin, some from Arnold. These mingling of voices and fusions of Victorian utterances are a brilliant example of pastiche. This technique of pastiche is used by Fowles as a device to subvert the monolithic dominion of a single dominant voice. Irony is also a device practiced by John Fowles to subvert the traditional assumptions and values. Dr. Grogan, 
claims with countless instances of medical melancholia that Sarah Woodruff is prone to melancholic situation. But the real fact is, she alone is that sort of girl who has an independent evolutionary cast of mind. All other characters are somehow or other hypocritical or immature. Sarah alone is that kind of girl who can sacrifice everything for freedom. She sacrificed even her love for freedom. She took delight in her lover's evolutionary progress via lifelong loneliness. Charles Smithson sympathized her, but ironically, it is she who had to show pity to him. Through the device of irony, Foul subverts Charles Smithson's shallow and deflected interest in Darwinian evolution. Charles Smithson appears keenly interested in Darwinian theory of evolution, but ironically enough, he had to be taught by Sarah in the line of existential evolution. By the agency of ironic device, John Fowles happens to achieve the experimental success of subverting Victorian alikism thinly embodied in the paleontologist Charles Smithson. The third important experimental device to achieve subversive goal is the distortions of narrative time. In chapter 13, Fowles interrupts into the line of narrative progression. He interrogates the notion of literary omniscience. Fowles asserts he is free to give what orders he likes to his characters. He adds that he can freely walk in the universe of his fiction without being constrained by the narrative conventions of Victorian ages. John Fowles enters into the narrative and broods over the destiny of his characters. At the time of his intrusion into the narrative structure, Fowles talks about the power of authorship to change the inevitable destiny of his characters. John Fowles' intrusion or forcible entry into the narrative structure of the French lieutenant's woman distorts the narrative. Since this distortion of narrative time has added new crucial elements in the structure of the French lieutenant's woman, it is a postmodern novel. This distortion of narrative time produces discontinuity and gaps and holes in the line of narrative progression. These gaps and holes in narrative developments are called anachronism. Since there are scattered elements of discontinuity and anachronism in the narrative progression of the French lieutenant's woman, it is a postmodern metafiction. Ambivalence and blurring or nearly mixing of genres are two subverting strategies to introduce elements of postmodernism in fiction. In the French lieutenant's woman, John Fowles is ambivalent. If asked whether he completely knows who Sarah is, his answer is somewhat ambivalent. If asked why did Sarah reject the man she thinks she loves, Fowles says to help him to evolve. If again asked why did she intend Charles to evolve, his answer will be because she loved him. Uh, she intended him to evolve. That much only. Even the ending of the novel is somewhat ambivalent. If readers want a Victorian mode of happy ending, Fowles ends the novel by showing Sarah accepting Charles. If the readers want postmodern ending, Fowles certainly ends the novel by showing Charles as a rejected lover, a jilted lover condemned to evolve existentially in the sphere of freedom. Besides the strategy of ambivalence, there is another strategy of blurry of genres. John Fowles has added chapter-wise epigraph to make a parody of many Victorian voices. While reading the French lieutenant's woman, it seems as if it is a document. It is an anthropological and sociological record of those who avoided the rigorously moralistic Victorian society and came to the Bay of Lyme Bridges. 
After reading Dr. Grogan's several examples of melancholic patients, we feel as if Sarah is a poor victim of melancholia and we are reading a medical treatise with an element of wonder. Having seen recurrent emphasis upon the Darwinian theory of evolution, we feel as if we are reading a geological or paleontological account. The French lieutenant's woman presents an account of rampant prostitution in London and the rapid rise of the middle class. It brings into foreground several facets of the urbanized lentil life. Moreover, the French lieutenant's woman is not a piece of fiction, it is a metafiction. As a metafiction, it questions the generic conventions of fiction. If possible, it blurs several generic conventions. Thus, John Force has introduced the elements of experimental postmodernism by making an experimentally subversive use of all these devices. Hence, it would be no exaggeration to say that the French lieutenant's woman is an experimentally postmodernist metafiction.